Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and while you're turning there, I just want to say I love the seminary. I love the students of the seminary. I love the faculty at the seminary. I love the president of the seminary. Um, He has been such a good friend to me and partner together in the gospel and not just to me to my family when i tell my kids last night as we were having just time in prayer together hey i'm going to southeastern tomorrow and uh you know where uh the aiken's granddad is president so uh mr danny would go and play basketball outside when he would come to visit uh paul and his family who lived just a few doors down from us when we were in Richmond. And uh, uh, Mr. Danny would go out there and do one on three versus Micah and two of my boys. And they remember like just terrorizing Mr. Danny on the basketball court, like totally like, and he apparently allowed it to a certain extent. Like no, you could foul as much as you want. And so they, they did. And uh, so anyway, I, I praise God for his grace in this place and the way his grace here is resounding to his glory far from this place. And it's pure joy and honor to be here, particularly as part of this Stand for Life uh, emphasis on campus today. I know uh, Dr. Aiken mentioned coming back tonight, I think there's uh, coffee on the lawn at six o'clock out there and just time to, to gather together. But then at seven, we'll come back in and think biblically about how to Uh, approach this issue of abortion in our country in our day? How do we respond biblically to legal decisions? And how do we engage biblically in political discussions? And I was asked to speak this morning specifically on building a foundation to care for the vulnerable. And my mind immediately went to James 1, 27. So I'll put it up here on the screen. Um, I hope you, you have it. You can follow along in the Bible. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. There is so much here in one small verse. Let's just... Take it word for word. Religion. Is that up here? There we go. Religion. So this word for personal or corporate expression of devotion to a transcendent God. I'm riding in an Uber this morning to the airport with a man from Nepal, and I ask him, what religion are you? What do you believe about who God is, what it means to worship him? It's a religion that is pure, it's clean, holy. This is the same word that Matthew uses to describe the clean linen shroud that wrapped Jesus' body after he was taken down from the cross. It's pure and undefiled. Jesus, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 tells us is undefiled unstained by sin. So pure and undefiled religion before God the Father. So this is God on high speaking very clearly to you and me right now about what some of your translations say is acceptable religion before him. He's reminding us of what we see throughout scripture, that there are types of religion that are unacceptable to God. So what kind of religion is pure and undefiled, acceptable before God? That's a very important question. To think that it's possible for us to go through religious lives, religious exercises, a religious education, and to do it all in a way that is not acceptable before God? So, 
The word has our attention at this point. What kind of religion is pure and undefiled? And the answer is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now we know this is not an exhaustive definition of religion. The verse right before this one tells us another mark of true religion, a bridled tongue. Or the verses before that, which highlight the necessity of receiving and obeying the implanted word of God that is able to save our souls. So this definition of religion in verse 27 may not be exhaustive, but it is essential. So pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is at least these two actions. One, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, in their affliction or distress. So we'll call this sacrificial care for the vulnerable. Pure and undefiled religion necessarily involves sacrificial care for the vulnerable. Orphans and widows, this vulnerable pair that we see all throughout the Bible, often also including sojourners. From the introduction of the law in Exodus 22, 22, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child, orphan. Deuteronomy 10, 17 and 18 tells us how the great, mighty, and awesome God executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Psalm 68, 5, God is father of the fatherless and protector of the widows. That's who God is in his holy habitation, which is why he commands his people Isaiah 1.17, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Jeremiah 22, verse 3, thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness, deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed, and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow. Don't sit around debating justice as if that is somehow doing justice. Do it. Don't sit around debating oppression. Deliver the oppressed. And care for the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow. So it's no surprise to come to James 1.27 and to see this pair yet again in God's word. Yet this verse uses a fascinating word to describe what pure and undefiled religion does with the orphan and the widow. It visits them. Now what does that mean? What is God telling us to do? To stop in and say hello to them? Just came by to visit, to visit an orphan, to visit a widow. Is that to spend a little time with them and then move on with our lives? Or is there more to it than that? Well, this, this word, it's translated visit here, is used 11 times in the New Testament and a few additional times in the Old Testament, the Septuagint, and it sure seems like more than just making a short visit. And take you on a tour. Genesis chapter 50, verse 24, is the first time we see this word. When Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you. He's not just stopping in to say hello. He's going to bring you up out of this land, to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That's what it means for God to visit, to come and bring someone out of a land of slavery. Psalm chapter 8, verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? And the word for 
Care here is the same word that's translated visit in Genesis 50, 24. God visits, cares for us, men and women made in his image. Psalm 106, verse 4, remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them. The word for help here is the same word, describing how God shows favor to his people and saves them. So then it's no surprise to get to the New Testament and we see this word, Luke chapter 1, verse 68, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. God in Jesus, this is announcing the coming of Jesus, is not coming to just say hello. He's coming to redeem them, to make them totally new, to change their lives forever. That's what happens when God visits. Just in the same way, 10 verses later, look at this imagery. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. God, in his tender mercy, visits us like the sun shining upon us, rising upon us, bringing light to the darkness, guiding our feet into the way of peace peace. What a powerful picture of visiting. Then Luke chapter 7, after Jesus raises a widow's son from the dead, the Bible says, fear seized them all, and they glorify God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. Ha! Jesus is God's definition of visitation. God has come to bring people from death to life. And not just Jesus. Look at this description of Moses in Acts chapter seven, verse 23. When he was 40 years old, this is Stephen recounting history in the Old Testament. When Moses was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. Moses visits his brothers. What does that mean? He's seeking them out to take responsibility for their deliverance, their well-being, their future, their destiny. At the Jerusalem Council, a few chapters later, in chapter 15, James speaks up and says, Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. God has visited the nations, not just to say hello, but to bring them into his family. Is this not an amazing word? To visit? We haven't even mentioned what's probably the most well-known passage where we see this word straight from the mouth of Jesus in Matthew chapter 25 when he says, when you visit the vulnerable, the imprisoned, the hungry, the sick, you visit me. You visit me. This is Jesus saying that. So are we hearing what God is saying to us? Religion that is pure and undefiled before him is not merely paying token attention to the vulnerable. It is doing for them what I have done for you. It's going to them, caring for them, taking responsibility for their well-being, raising them up, bringing them out, giving them life. The implications are staggering in a culture, in, in a country where millions of babies are vulnerable in their mother's wombs, where multitudes of children are vulnerable out of the womb in need of moms and dads who need help in many ways to care for them. And pure and undefiled religion takes responsibility for the care of those vulnerable children in the womb, out of the womb, and all the way to the tomb, specifically widows. I think of Randy and Courtney. 
a couple who spent the first 30 plus years of their lives in cultural Christianity, in religion that is not acceptable before God, until one day God visited them, was preaching through Ruth, and God met them in a powerful way and spoke to their hearts about his love for them, opened their eyes to new life in him. They were born again. And with new birth came sacrificial compassion for the vulnerable, particularly widows. Randy is an electrician by trade. Courtney is a nurse practitioner. So they started looking for opportunities to visit widows in their affliction. And long story short, they now spend their weekends and many days during the week doing pretty unglamorous deeds in widows' homes, rewiring electricity, fixing plumbing, building wheelchair ramps, cleaning bathrooms, changing diapers, delivering medicine, visiting and staying with and caring for many of these widows until their last breath. I've heard from some of the people whom Randy and Courtney have visited. I'd love for you to hear from them too. One widow writes, Randy and Courtney are my friends. They're my family. I believe that God sent them to me to encourage me and to help me. Sometimes I ask God if they are even real. It's like God has sent me some angels to take care of me. They pray with me. They help me with my house. They always come and check on me. They bring me food and groceries. They read the Bible with me. I know that they care. Sometimes I just feel like I want to cry because I'm so thankful to God for sending them. That sounds like a visit. Another writes, when I see Jesus, I'm going to tell him everything Randy and Courtney did to help me and serve me and take care of me. One more who said, I spent over 20 years without a friend. Then Randy and Courtney became my friends. They've given their life to show mercy to people like me. And to me, that is the very picture of who Jesus is. The woman who said those words was elderly and disabled and recently went to be with the Lord and she died holding her friend Courtney's hand. This is what it means to visit. It means sacrificial care for the vulnerable in the world, in their affliction. A word that can include everything from oppression to tribulation. Let's not forget that the reason orphans and widows exist in the world is because sin and suffering and death exist in the world. Which means visiting orphans and widows in their affliction will never be easy for them or for those doing the visiting. Babies are aborted and children are orphaned and widows are alone because we live in a fallen world. And in the middle of it, God is saying, pure religion, undefiled religion, steps into the fallenness and cares for, looks after, takes responsibility for the well-being of the vulnerable. You know, that Greek word for visit has antonyms, opposites as well, to neglect or to forget or to ignore. That's what unacceptable religion does with the vulnerable. Acceptable, pure, undefiled religion sacrificially cares for the vulnerable in the world. That is not an option for the church. That is an obligation for the church. And, so that's the word here, and does this in such a way that we keep ourselves unstained from the world. So the second mark of true religion in this verse, sacrificial care for the vulnerable in the world, then second, let's call it clear separation from the ways of the world. Now we might read this and think, okay, moral purity Sounds good, be morally pure. Let's turn the page on James 1 and get ready for James 2. But remember, the chapter divisions are from us, not from James. 
which means that what follows in chapter 2, verse 1, flows from chapter 1, verse 27. So let's think about how these verses relate to each other. It's interesting, James mentions the world three other times in the book. You can turn and look at him, James chapter 2, verse 5, as James is talking about the sin of favoritism in the church. He writes, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? James chapter 3, verse 6, talking about the tongue. James writes, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. And then there's chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James is clearly referring here to a fallen world system that is set up against the ways of God. And true religion, the Bible is saying in James 1.27, does not live according to this fallen world system. Which is why in chapter 2, James immediately applies this to favoritism toward the rich, which is the way the world works. The world loves to honor the rich and ignore the poor. And the church was living according to the ways of the world. Listen to James 2, verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing, say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are, what we just read, poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Do you hear what the Holy Spirit is saying here through James? According to the world, you go out of your way to honor and respect and treat well the person who, watch this, can benefit you the most. Let me say that one more time. According to the world, you go out of your way to honor and respect and treat well the person who can benefit you the most. But that is not true religion, unstained by the world. That is false religion stained by the world. True religion, so make the connection with the first mark of true religion, sacrificial care for the vulnerable in the world. You go out of your way to honor and respect and treat well to take care of those who this world would say benefit you the least. At which point we might be quick to think, wow, that was obviously a problem for the church then. Uh, Things are different today. But is that true? How common is it in churches today for the people who make the most money to have the most influence? The direction of so many churches and ministries, even seminaries and denominations can easily be driven by the rich. May it not be so among us. It is detestable to God. I'm convicted about this when I think about the model of church that I pastor, which I think is similar to many, maybe most churches where we spend, whether it's thousands, tens of thousands, or millions of dollars on nice buildings and elaborate programs. Why? To appeal to the poor? Don't we do so much in our churches, maybe unknowingly, but in the end, ultimately, to appeal to the rich. People who have much and want comfort and expect excellence. So we spend the resources of God trying to appeal to, or dare I say, appease them. Is this how people organize themselves who are called to sacrificially care for the vulnerable in the world? Just think about our church planting strategies. 
Don't most of our strategies depend on a certain income level in the people we're trying to reach? Why are we not planting more churches in more vulnerable communities? Could it be because they can't afford us and our church planting models? Here or around the world, where billions, billions have never even heard the gospel, many of them living in extreme poverty and suffering. Why then do we spend millions reaching the rich around us and relative pennies reaching the unreached and impoverished far from us? Is this pure and undefiled religion or is this religion stained by the world? Religion that is pure and undefiled visits orphans and widows in their distress sacrificially cares for the vulnerable in this world and keeps our lives unstained, clearly separate from the ways of this world. Even as I've meditated on this verse and thought about this issue of abortion in our country, I can't help but to grieve in part because, yes, praise God for the overturning of a law that made abortion a legal right in our country. Praise God for a monumental decision for the vulnerable in the womb. Yet don't we grieve at how we as the church have not kept ourselves unstained from the world in the process. Don't we grieve over how we have adopted the ways of this world, everything from worldly speech to worldly strategies to worldly politics to worldly personalities in order to get to this point. God, help us to care sacrificially for the vulnerable in the world while maintaining clear separation from the ways of the world. So what does this look like in your life? Sacrificial care for the vulnerable that makes clear you're not living according to the ways of this world. What does this look like in your family? What does this look like in your church? I know that I and my family have much room to grow here as does the church I pastor. But I so want to grow. I want this kind of religion, pure and undefiled, to mark my life and my family and the church I pastor and us together as the church before God our Father in this world in a way that reflects God our Father to this world. Isn't that the beauty of this whole verse? This is our What we read in Psalm 68 earlier, he is father of the fatherless and protector of widows. That's who God is in his holy habitation. Do you see it? Sacrificial care for the vulnerable in this world, clear separation from the ways of this world. Praise be to our God. Praise be to Jesus, who has come to visit us in our vulnerability who has come to care for and deliver and save and redeem and take responsibility for our eternal well-being. Praise Jesus, completely unstained by the sin of this world, dying on the cross to pay the price for our sin, rising from the grave in victory over sin so that we, orphaned by sin, might become sons and daughters of God. Praise God for the gospel. Praise God in the words of Hosea 14, 3, in you the orphan finds mercy. So I read that and I think about my own story. Some of you have heard me share about how my wife Heather and I struggled and agonized through years of infertility, with God not blessing us with children in the way we desired, and how God used that journey to open our eyes 
to children in need. And I would have said at that point, as we began an adoption process, this is kind of second best since we couldn't have children this way. And it's really interesting, Rick Morton sitting down here on the front row here, who works with Lifeline. He was teaching at New Orleans Seminary at that time. And he was one of the first conversations my wife and I had with about adoption because they had just walked through an adoption process. Just full circle that moment hitting me right now. And we, we thought, ah, oh, this is kind of second best. We learned real quick, this is just as best. And uh, the Lord led us to Kazakhstan where we adopted our first son, Caleb. And we got back and two weeks later found out Heather was pregnant. So what happens in Kazakhstan doesn't stay in Kazakhstan. So anyway, sorry, it's, it's, it's not appropriate. Not appropriate. It was just sitting right there, right? So anyway, fast forward. Uh, nine months later, Joshua uh, comes along. So Caleb and Joshua, we obviously knew at this point we were able to have children biologically, but uh, we also knew we wanted to adopt again. We started an adoption process from Nepal that uh, went, yeah, fell through uh, after we'd been through that process for a while. We uh, started another process from China. We adopted our daughter, Mara, from China. And then three months later, got home and Heather was pregnant again. And uh, her doctor said, you adopt four, you'll have eight. We were like, no. So we, uh, <laughs> so, uh, we were joyfully content with four children until one night, uh, so a few years ago, we were uh, going out on our regular date night and uh, we hadn't even planned on talking about adoption. Like it wasn't even on the agenda at dinner. And it came up, and the Lord, the only way I can describe it is the Lord met us at that table and just told us we still had a lot of love left to give. And there were a lot of children in need of that love. And so we started an adoption process again uh, from China. And uh, we were three days away from going to pick our son up, uh, J.D., uh, in January 2020, when we got a message that there was a, a virus in China, so we'd be delayed for a couple of weeks. Well, two and a half years later, we're still waiting to go get him. So I have a son, a long way away from me, that can't wait to bring into our home and pray daily for God to open that door. But then a few months after that, Heather and I, we, we do the same Bible reading plan with our church family, and we were in Psalm 127. Children, heritage from the Lord, blesses the man whose quiver is full of them. And both of us just had the sense that even with adding JT, JD to our family that uh, our quiver wouldn't be full. And both of us had this sense, how do I share this with the other? <laughs> and so we both start praying, and then again, it comes up as, as we're on a date, and it's what happens on date nights. Uh, so we start talking, like, I was thinking this, I was thinking this. And so we came to the conclusion that God was leading us to uh, visit uh, another child in need. And so we started a parallel process uh, from uh, domestically uh, through Lifeline. And uh, fast forward to just about a year ago, a little less than a year ago. Um, so Lifeline, a great gospel-centered ministry that walks alongside birth moms um, and helps them care for children whenever that's possible. If, when that's not possible or best, then helps them uh, find a family that they can place that child with and relationship with that family. And so we got uh, a profile sent to us about a birth mom. And when this was sent to us, uh, it said, hey, here's some information about this, this birth mom. One thing you need to know, though, is that sh she's going to have a little girl about a month from now, but she already has a name picked out for her little girl, which we were kind of bummed as soon as we saw that, if I could be honest, because we for years have said if the Lord ever gave us another daughter, we'd love to name her Mercy. And that's just not the most common name. So, But we were like, of course, that's not a deal breaker. So... We, uh, we open up this profile, and we read all about this beautiful birth mom. And we get to the end, and she says, I just have already picked out a name that I really want for my little girl. I really want her to be named Mercy. So that began a process where over the next 
month, we got to know this beautiful, brave, selfless birth mom who was doing what she believed was best for her beautiful baby girl. And I just want to say very loud and clear that we honor her. We honor her trust in the Lord, her desire for her her daughter's good and adoption through this process. There is no question, there will never be a question about how much mercy is loved by her birth mom. And we honor her dad as an image bearer of God. But all of that to say, about a week later, uh, after we had had some initial contact with her, she ended up giving birth to Mercy. And this is Mercy being held happily in her first mom's arms. A Couple of days after that, we met them both and This birth mom entrusted Heather and me to be mom and dad to Mercy. And here is my wife with our precious little girl who uh, a few days after this, uh, we found ourselves in a courtroom via Zoom uh, telling a judge and anybody who would listen in that courtroom about how much God loves this little girl and about Her birth mom's love for her and our love for her told the whole story about her name and by the end the judge was like well you've got us in this courtroom in tears and she pronounced that mercy was a member of the platt family so uh this is one of my favorite i've got about five thousand other pictures that i could show you right now but uh i i will show you this just a little picture of the chaos in our home so just the other night i was given uh mercy uh a bottle before I put her to bed, just singing over her, uh, praying over her, peacefully looking up at me. So this was her looking up at me. When all of a sudden the rest of the family got home and came barging into the room, kissing all over her, playing with her, which led to this picture, where it's like, <laughs> she's thinking, just put me in the bed. Like I was, I was just about to go to bed. So all this, all this to say, I so want to live a James 127 life. And I want to lead a James 127 family, and I want to lead a James 127 church. And I have so far to go. I trust that's likely true for all of us. But it's worth it. Let's not settle for anything less than pure and undefiled religion before our God. Let's sacrificially care for the vulnerable in the world, and let's do so with clear separation from the ways of the world. Will you bow your heads with me? These guys are gonna come and lead us in a song. And before they do, I don't wanna say anything else. I wanna give you just a moment in quiet. I don't know how this word lands on your heart and life. And I want to give you a moment before we stand and sing and move on, just to respond in your own heart to whatever God by his spirit is speaking into your life.